Did you realize that you have, that we have two hearts in the human body? Now, it would be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, some people right away, I say, they say, hey, I need, that's what I need, a backup, you know, <laughs> backup. But it's not quite that way. It's better than that in a way. Uh, so you can see I'm talking about the coronary heart or the chest heart and, and the cranial heart. So, you know, the number one killer, right, in the, in the, the world now. It used to be, it was not always true in the developing world, but now it's true around the world. The, the major killer is heart disease. And you see a little illustration here of, of uh, some folks, uh, EMTs, right, working on this man who's had a heart attack. His heart stopped. So they're trying to restart it. You know what the real problem is? In the vast majority, I would 99.9% .9 of the cases, when a person has a heart attack, even if it kills them, the heart, a few moments before the heart attack, the heart muscle was not actually bad at all. The heart muscle, in most cases, is, is pretty good shape. What happened was a blood vessel supplying the muscle was plugged up enough with plaque that a, when a clot lodged in that small opening, it stopped the blood flow and killed an otherwise fairly healthy heart muscle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the chance of using my pointer and see how that works. But anyway, so, so you see here the, the lining of the vessel. This is what the size should be. But there's been a large atheroma or plaque inside this artery, and there was just a small opening, and that's where that clot lodged and cut off the blood flow to the heart muscle. So we have two hearts. One resides in the chest. That's the one you're most familiar with, I'm sure. But one, this one, the chest heart, do you realize it beats over 42 million times a year? Four billion times in a lifetime? Did you know that the first tissue that you can identify in a developing fetus with the naked eye, if the typical layman I'm saying here, is the heart? because you will see pulsatile tissue. You will see tissue that's pulsing, and there's not even any blood yet. Your heart has been beating before there was blood for it to pump. And then that, that tissue folds in upon itself and produces a, four, a beautiful four-chambered heart. But, so that heart has been beating ever since before you were born. You realize if it stops for a few seconds, you pass out. If it stops for a few minutes, you don't wake up. So it's not surprising that this has become the major focus of our thinking about our body. But there's another heart in the human body. It's as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, for example. This scripture is not talking about our chest heart. It's talking about our brain heart. And in fact, studies show that this is primarily in the frontal lobes of the brain, the executive center, the center of choice and resolve in the brain. Now, whereas the chest heart is continually beating, the brain heart is continually making new connections. Have you ever thought about the fact that the, you have learned during your lifetime, especially if you're as old as most, many of us in this room, you've learned a lot. And yet, all that information stored in your brain your cranium hasn't really gotten any larger. It's about the same size now as it was when you were two years old. And yet it has hundreds and thousands of times more facts and information in there. Where is it all hidden? It's because we learn things by new connections. And it is the neural network is the most information-dense structure known to man. And so continually making connections, and that is requiring, by the way, did you know that the brain consumes about 25% of the cardiac output, about 25% of the blood pumped by the chest heart is used to supply the brain. And a big piece of that is the frontal lobes. Now, you know, science is exploring the, the uh, cranium and this wonderful organ of the brain. And do you know that in the last couple of months, I, I uh, read... We, they can now read with about 90% accuracy, 
can read what you're going to say milliseconds before you say it. My wife is a very practical woman, and she says, what good is that? You know. Well, it's a very tiny step, but I believe that we'll, we will be able to do it sooner and sooner. And it is actually important because it, what's, where this really has been interesting is someone who has lost their vocal cords, they cannot make the sound, but they can think it, and the computer can speak it. And so we're getting the ability to be able to produce a uh, voice box for someone. And when we get that, then we can actually give your voice box a different language and you can speak in Russian instead of English or uh, Spanish instead of French because the computer can take that word and turn it into a... Anyway, I'm just giving you a, a little f a futuristic thinking, but it is true. This is actually happening right now. Can't read our minds yet. Um, I said there. Now, Phineas Gage is, uh, I don't know if he's well-known in this country, but he's pretty, fairly well-known uh, in the U.S. anyhow. And he's, uh, here's a photograph of him. He had a famous accident, and he's holding this, uh, it looks like a gun the way he's holding it, but this is actually the instrument of his, of his injury. Uh, it's a tamping rod. And they've done studies on him. In fact, uh, I, I'll show you the citation. This is an actual... A uh, picture of his his own, his uh, cranium. This is Phineas Gage's skull, and you can see the uh, interesting problem he had. He what happened was the accident put a this tamping rod through his brain and out the top of his head. And this was uh, an article I have picked up. I'll show you the citation in a minute. Where they're still to this day. This is published in the last few months. They're modeling, trying to figure out the neural damage that had to take place in his brain to explain the change in Phineas Gage. I'm going to tell you in a minute what the change was. It didn't obviously kill him. But here's some of the computer simulations of the connections that they're uh, modeling to try and understand what happened to Phineas Gage's brain and how that could explain what uh, the phenotype, the results. Here's some more. There's the citation. You can see PLOS 1, 2012. But anyway... So what happened was that he survived this accident where he was tamping uh, the dynamite with this rod and one day when he was tamping the dynamite went off before it was supposed to and the rod became a missile went right through his head uh, marvelously, didn't kill him, uh, but it did take out one eye and, and it basically destroyed most of the frontal lobe of his brain and the connections. And what the reports, and you can read this, it's in, the, it's in the history, you can read these reports, but Phineas dramatically had a change in personality and character. He had been a, a, a good worker, a hardworking fellow, family man, upstanding citizen, all the normal good things. He became a profligate. He ended up going to uh, South America. He was from North America. He went to South America, wine, women, and song, an expression, I don't know if you use that, here, but that's one we have in the U.S. He basically lived it up. He did come back to the U.S. and died actually in San Francisco, and that's how he happened to um, have, the, have his um, cranium to study to this day. So when he lost the frontal lobes, he lost his moral resolve. He lost his, his uh, character, if you will. He lost uh, what we might call conscience. I mean, he, he became... Everyone testified, this is a different man, different person. So two hearts in the human body, but actually one... Oh, yes. I got ahead of myself. You're, you're familiar with heart transplants, right? If they, if they did a heart transplant down at the hospital, would it, it wouldn't be in the news, would it? I mean, we've, we've had so many heart transplants now that it's no big deal. Although, of course, if it's you, it, it's a big deal. But what I mean is, it, we know how to do this. Did you realize that they're talking uh, about uh, a brain transplant? That's, uh, we've got the heart transplants down pretty well, so now maybe let's we'll see what we can do with brain transplant. But I want to ask you a question. I see some of you shaking your head. I want you to think about this. Would you be interested in a brain transplant? Because a heart transplant is a donor heart, but a brain transplant is a donor body. So you want somebody else's brain in your body. So, you know, I, you'll, you can easily relate, right? I have found, the, I have not yet found the first person that's really interested in a brain transplant. 
we're all interested in a body donation, you know, but we don't want to have a transplant somebody's brain into our body. And what, so what is my point? It's, it, it's, it is kind of cute and fun, but that, that I found nothing better to prove to you what I am going to say, and that is that of the two hearts in the human body, the brain heart is actually the most important to us. We spend all of our time and we think about the chest heart. Do you realize we spend around the globe, we spend more money in health care on the chest heart than anything else? But, the real thing, but what we're really interested in is the brain heart. In fact, I would dare say that the reason that you will allow someone to cut open your sternum, pry apart your chest, take out your heart and put someone else's in is because you're actually concerned about the brain heart. You want to keep the brain heart working. And, and if the chest heart fails, it's going to kill your brain heart. So, so of the two, the cranial or the brain heart is the most important uh, in, the, in the body. Two hearts, one killer. This is where I was a minute ago. I got ahead of myself. One killer. Did you realize that? So we looked at this killer of the chest heart. That's the, a blockage in the coronary artery. But do you realize that the same thing happens in the brain? We call, it a, we call these strokes. Increasingly, we're calling this a brain attack so that people understand it's the exact same disease, exact same process. It just happens in different vessels. If it happens to the vessels going to your heart, chest heart, we call it a coronary artery disease. If it's going to your brain heart, we would call it a ischemic vascular disease, a cerebrovascular accident. Okay, now there's another important point. I'm building a case here. I'm going to, put you, I'm going to give you about four different points, and then I'm, we're going to connect the dots for something I think you'll see is quite interesting. Another piece of information is that the disease that kills both hearts is actually atherosclerosis, blockages of the arteries. And it turns out that since atherosclerosis is a systemic condition, if you, if you have it in one place in your body, you have it in other places, there's about a 90% correlation between the blockages in one place in your body and others. So we use that in medicine to, to uh, look at the carotid artery. The carotid artery is very close to the surface here in your neck. It's very easy for me to do an ultrasound and look at the thickness of the walls. I, if I try to look at the thickness of the walls in your coronary arteries, I have to go through your ribs or stick something down your throat uh, and, and, and esophagus, and that's, most people don't care for that experience. And so it's a lot easier to look at the carotid artery. And from that, I can infer with 90% accuracy what's happening to the coronary arteries. Well, I can also infer with 90% accuracy what's happening to your brain arteries, right? Exactly. And so if you have problems with the coronary arteries, you have a 90% correlation that you're going to have some problems with your brain arteries too, right? Now, these two hearts are affected differently from a lack of blood flow. What is the com most common symptom of lack of adequate blood flow to the coronary arteries or to the chest heart? It's pain. Exactly. Very good. And by the way, just a practical thing, it can be pain in the back. You can have pain that seems to be under the bottom of the scapula, and that can be uh, a posterior uh, lack of blood flow to the posterior part of the heart. So if you have uh, some strange pain at the back of your, uh, by your scapula, and, and you have any reason to suspect it could be cardiac, you might want to check that out. But what about the brain heart? Before, you, before uh, you try to tell me what the first symptoms are, let me tell you a little story. When I was, uh, I took medicine in, later in life, so I was a little older than most students when I went to medical school. Some would say much older, but anyway. And, uh, and I remember how impressed I was the first time I was in uh, as a student in the neurosurgery operating suite. And uh, we were, there was a gentleman who uh, was getting the surgery, and he had a movement disorder. And the surgeon who was working on him had a remarkable success rate uh, in a very difficult surgery he would do where he would uh, put some probes into the brain towards the base of the brain and there in this certain uh, cortex he would destroy a few cells. Um, and the result was almost miraculous in how much better the person could move. 
And so they had cut the hole in the man's uh, cranium, little hole saw, very much like any ordinary carpenter might use, took the little circle of, of uh, cranium away and had opened up the uh, dura mater. There's a sort of a tough lining over the brain. And he had cut that and opened that up. And he put two wires, two wires in there about where he was thinking he needed to be to, to kill these cells. We're going to use a small electrical charge radio frequency. And then he told the anesthesiologist, uh, wake him up. I'm like, wake him up? He has a hole in his head with wires sticking out of it. And, uh, and so he woke him up and he says, okay, now I want you to move your arm. You see, he needed to have the, the man be able to move to make sure he was at the right place. That was part of his secret of his success. So that man did not feel a thing when we were moving those wires in his brain. There is no pain sensation inside the dura meda. We could have taken a scalpel and scooped out brain tissue and he wouldn't have felt anything. It would have changed the way he, his emotional or his, but his thinking or his movement ability it would not have caused any pain. So what are the first symptoms of lack of blood flow to the brain heart? Well, the studies have been done where we have introduced carbon dioxide into the carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries to, to starve the brain for oxygen by putting carbon dioxide. And the first area affected is the frontal lobes. And the first noticeable effect is a sort of inebriation where a loosening of the, of the inhibitions. You just get a little more relaxed, you know, and tell, enjoy jokes, have, have a little more fun. Very much like inebriation. And as one who has been inebriated, not to brag on it, but it's a fact, I have uh, not always been a Christian and haven't always lived a, a, an upright life. I've had my occasions of being inebriated. And, and it makes your moral resolve weak. Wouldn't you agree? Um, that's what we find. That the first symptoms of lack of blood flow to the brain heart is a lack of, inhib of inhibition and a loosening of moral resolve. So, it's not pain. Now, here's I'm going to start to pull the dots together for you. Do you realize that in your chest heart, when we do an exam looking, looking at the blockages in your coronary arteries, the typical thing we'll do is a, tread, a stress test. Okay, That's the typical way to do this. If you go to your doctor and the cardi cardiologist checks you out, they'll do a, a stress test. And we can only detect a problem if the blockage is 70% or greater. The reason is that you're sitting here right now, your heart rate may be 60, 70 beats a minute. But if there was a large explosion, the floor shook and pillars started falling, you would have an increase in heart rate easily to two to three times. You, your heart rate will climb to 150 or above quickly uh, in an emergency. And my point is that the vessels supplying that muscle have to have a lot of reserve capacity. Because of that, it's very hard to detect a blockage until it's pretty high. However, in the brain, the brain heart, you might think that the brain rests at night. And there's a sense in which it certainly does some recuperative action, but the brain actually is consuming as much sugar and as much oxygen while you're asleep as while you're awake. Our brains work at a pretty much the same rate all the time. And so there is no particular reserve capacity in the arteries to the brain. And therefore, we can actually detect a blockage or a shortage of blood at a lower level. Less than 20%, we can detect changes in brain function. Uh, so, I want to ask you a question. Suppose that you only have about a 50% blockage in your arteries and it's a systemic condition. So you've got about 50% more or less everywhere. Will you have any symptoms of heart disease in your chest heart? If you go to the cardiologist, he'll tell you you're doing great. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. But could you be having symptoms to your brain, heart? Absolutely. And what might those symptoms be? Well, if you're over 50, most people say, well, you're, you're just getting old. You know, you're just, it would be things such as, uh, again, inability to make those decisions that you want to make last. 
I can't seem to do what I want to do. Can't seem to keep my resolve. Can't keep my New Year's resolutions. Might be that I'm having trouble forming memories. I can't remember where my car is. Where's my car keys? When you start wondering where the car is, then you're really in trouble, right? Uh, So, this is not actually God's plan that we have those kind of problems. Did you realize in Genesis 129 it says, And see, I've given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Do you know that actually, according to scriptures, there was a plan for a diet that was optimal for the, for the human creature. In fact, by the way, my own personal experience is that that verse I just read you made me a vegetarian. When I realized that there was a creator, came to that conclusion, I wasn't born. I, was, I, I spent much of my life as an antagonistic agnostic um, and very much uh, tied to science and mathematics. I thought mathematics was probably the highest form of truth in the universe. And uh, many of you might be able to relate to that. But anyway, but when I ex- acknowledge that, there, that there, there is a creator, and, and some of you may not believe that, that's all right. I'm, I didn't either at one time. But I became convinced that if I could enter into the design, I would have the best performance. And so that's what I sought to do, is to enter into the design. Um, I had been a software engineer for years, so that kind of fit for me. So nuts, fruits, vegetables... Do you know Harvard has studied this, that text, Genesis 129? No, they didn't study one. But they, they did a study that, that looked at it. And they, they looked at their 85,000 nurses and 40-some thousand doctors and dentists. And they found that every daily serving of fruits and vegetables reduced the risk of coronary heart disease by 4%. In fact, they're a little, here's a little graph. So they actually have, we have scientific evidence for the validity of uh, of a portion of of Genesis 129, which I thought was quite interesting. So we know that grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables prepared in a simple way. The less you process them, the more healthful they are. This is solid evidence. I don't have time to go into those studies, but believe me, is there. I do want to show you this one question, and that is most everybody is willing to acknowledge that if you live a healthy lifestyle, it can reduce your risk of disease, right? I, I bet there's nobody here would challenge that thought. But the question is, can it reverse disease? Could you actually, can you actually reverse disease? Yes. Uh, and that's the question of this study, this uh, lifestyle heart trial that was done. And it was a randomized trial that uh, for one year, they, actually the one-year results were published and then five-year results. And here's what it was. 28 patients were assigned to an experimental group what were they? What terrible program were they on? They were on a low-fat vegetarian diet, smoking cessation, stress management, moderate exercise, and no medications. The other group had usual care. Now, all 48 of these people had documented heart disease. 28 were in a, a treatment group using lifestyle, and 20 had usual care. And what they found, this was published, I, you saw that citation maybe in Lancet, to, uh, 1990. But I want to show you the five-year results. That was published in 1998. And what we see here is that the pers- this is the control group. What were they getting? They were getting usual care. In, in five years, there was a progression of the blockages from angiogram. This is where they put the dye in the artery and look at the, angi- at the artery blockages. They increased by 27 point, almost 28%. By the way, what's the end point of that process? What, where, what, where is the natural end point of, of that. Yeah, yeah, death. That's a heart attack happening in slow motion. So then in the treatment group, however, they had a documented a, a drop of almost 8%. So the blockages had gotten more open, less of a blockage. They were melting, melting away. Net difference of 34%. Dr. Esselstyn has done a a study and published. Here's Dr. Crow's left anterior descending artery. You can see on the left here with the sort of lumpy, bumpy boundaries. But after 32 months on a plant-based diet without cholesterol-lowering medication because Dr. Crow was actually allergic to the statins. And here's what you see happen uh, in 32 months of intervention. This uh, Dr. Crow was a colleague of Dr. Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic. So the issue is not just knowledge. It's not knowing, but doing, right? Knowing what to do is only part of our problem. 
I don't know about you, but I can say to you as a fellow human being, I find the doing part oftentimes more difficult than knowing, although sometimes it is hard to know because there's a lot of conflicting evidence. But even once you decide that, okay, I know this is what I should do or want to do, have you ever had any challenge making it happen? And I do all the time. So I want to share something with you. What we need is not an anatomical transplant, but we need an attitudinal transplant. I'm not interested in having a brain transplant, but I am interested in having a different brain in a sense, that I want to have a different attitude, a different power. Of, and I want to tell you the good news. There's a surgeon that specializes in that exact surgery. Read it and tell me if you don't see it the same way. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And then it goes on, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I truly believe that this is talking about a renewal of our brain heart. And I know from personal experience, from my overcoming smoking and drinking and not a few other things, that I had wanted to stop because I knew they were not altogether good for me, but it wasn't really until I came to know God as a creator God that I gained a victory in the sense that I no longer struggle with cigarettes, I no longer struggle with alcohol, but I did struggle with them when I was trying to put them away in my own. So I think I had that surgery. Now I want to share a last illustration. You know, can you, can you hear me now? You've, you, know, you, you know how that... What's that? Can, are you still there? These things, these, these cell phones, you know, we couldn't live without them, but they're so hard to work with sometimes. I want to suggest to you, is it possible that if we are not getting the kind of circulation we need to the brain heart, that there might be a times when God is saying, can you hear me now, John? Can I get through? Are you hearing me? Do you? And I know my reason for wanting better health and better blood flow to all of my body really is I want that link, that connection with my loving creator God so that when he wants to talk to me, I don't have difficulty hearing and understanding what he has to say. And oh, I forgot I had this little commercial in here. You'll uh, chip the the complete health improvement program. It's really about better choices. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we'll do questions, I guess, later.